very important that it happened by the time of the first meeting. If there's one of us that knows, it would be you. I thought you were at Sydney Sussex by now. You must no, have I missed your induction ceremony. Oh, no. Oh, no. So they, 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 oh, they, yeah, oh no, we're going to do that for the uh, 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 No, I said uh, They're very insistent that you get inducted. Now I understand more of your, like, uh, you hold the hand of the uh, master. I know. <laughs> I mean, we might be set up. Yeah. Sort of. At some point, they'll be like, this is where you go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, that's fine. So it's recording. Oh, oh there you are. Yeah, yeah, we were just wondering. Sorry. We wanted to double check that we were yeah, actually yes, recording. Yes, um, we'd like to record it, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, if the recording is already set for the semester I got last week's up last week. Yeah, we um, have some Thursday ones here, you also. you know about that? I do not know about that. So okay, I thought Lindsay would tell you about that. Um, oh, you know, I take this that back. Thursday we this, she did tell me, and I added the dates already. Okay, so I, that, that's crucial because we need a record of these. Yes, interviews. I understand. Yeah. Should those go up on the public YouTube page, or are those um, private? Oh, crap. I can ask um, Lindsay about that, if that makes sense. Yeah, ask Lindsay about that. Okay. Then she'll ask me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well then you can. I, I think they're, pro they're public because anyone who's a candidate for a job in business is a public candidate. Yes, that makes sense. So, yeah. The secret is going to be invited. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in that case, so is it okay if we record your talk? Yeah. Can we put it on YouTube? Uh, sure. <laughs> if, if you change your mind, that's totally fine. It's up to you. So okay. we chop it up and put it on TikTok? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's up to Mitch. He's our TikTok guru around here. Um, right. You're plugged in. If you want to use the clicker, we'll have to plug in this USB. Um, yeah, actually, that would be that would be actually kind of nice we'll if we can get it to this. So you know, are you ready? Oh. You'll have to say allow. No. Yeah. No. Um, and use, no. So click the. Click continue. Are you ready for And I'm going to now click OK. Click NZ US. <laughs> there we are. Cool. Um, the top is the laser. If you hit the bottom and the screen goes blank, it's because this is the worst button ever made. It turns the screen off. Hit it again, it comes right back. Okay. We have thumb rest. So you like yeah, yeah, yeah. I will do it multiple times. Um, everybody, well, so far it hasn't been a big issue, but I always warn people because I know I would hit it. Yep. This okay. screen will turn off on you, everything else will be working, it's a bug, energy is fine, and only audio that goes into a microphone gets recorded, so I see okay. you're already plugged in, that's great. Yep. Um, give me like a test one, two. Test one, two, test one, two. You guys hear okay? Yeah. Testing, 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 one, two, one, two, three. Um, when we get it, actually, I'm going to do this. Testing, testing. That sounds better. Better? Yeah, it like, picks up better from the top. OK. And then I'm going to make Mitch talk into a mic, or else we don't get the intro recorded oh. either. Okay. Test, test. And after the intro, I'll dim the lights from up here. How you doing? Welcome. Thanks. <laughs> I guess we should go. OK. Welcome to uh, this week's uh, Monday Colloquium. Uh, I do want to start just start out by saying that we are going to have two colloquia this week. On Thursday, we will be meeting again here at 3.30 uh, for the first of our uh, talks associated with our uh, uh, faculty job search. And the speaker will be uh, Jorge Moreno from uh, uh, Pomona College talking, I don't know the title of their talk, but I think it's something to do with the low mass, low mass galaxies. Okay, our speaker today is Eric Coughlin, who uh, got his PhD here in 2016. I was uh, very fortunate to be able to work with him. Oh. Uh, and uh, he, um, so Eric is a great role model. Um, his approach to a success in our field is to get two Hubble fellowships, because that's what he did. He uh, um, immediately after uh, graduating here, he, uh, he took a Hubble to uh, Berkeley, uh, transferred it to uh, Columbia a year or two later, and then got a second Hubble, or maybe it was an Einstein or something. Einstein uh, and Hubble, yeah. And uh, went to Princeton before he uh, got a faculty position at Syracuse University, and he is now an assistant professor uh, in the physics department at Syracuse University. 
Um, Eric is an expert on a wide range of topics in dynamics and uh, fluid dynamics of energetic sources, uh, including tidal disruption events, but also other types of transient processes. And today, he's going to focus on tidal disruption events and tell us about how black holes destroy stars. Eric. Okay. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, great. Okay. Yeah, so thanks uh, for the introduction, Mitch, and thanks for all of you for coming and having me here. It's always great to be back in Boulder. Uh, yeah, the last time I was in this auditorium, pretty sure it was when I was defending my thesis, which was eight years ago, which is a lot longer ago than it feels, but I guess that's how it goes. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about some relatively new results in kind of fundamental advances in understanding tidal disruption events. So this is when a star is destroyed by the gravitational field of a supermassive black hole. And a lot of the, the results that I'll be talking about, um, or at least a fraction of them, are in this paper um, that we posted to the archive uh, late last year and then was actually just published um, earlier this month. Um, so the lead author here is Ananya Bandopadhyay, who's a graduate student in the department at Syracuse. Um, yeah. So to kind of just give you a, a, an overview of what I'm going to be discussing today with you. So I, I first want to start off just talking about the fundamentals of TDEs, tidal disruption events, um, because for one, I realize not all of you have thought about this problem uh, to the nauseating extent that I have. Um, you all have much more interesting and other things to be thinking about. And so I want to kind of make sure that we're all on the same page um, in understanding the fundamentals of this, um, this problem. Um, and also because it'll allow me to develop what's kind of one of the best known um, and most often applied analytical models for understanding TDEs, and in particular the accretion rate onto the black hole um, and how we can use that uh, to compare to simulations. Um, and what I'm going to show is that there is a um, very big discrepancy between the predictions of this well-known analytical model and the results of hydrodynamical simulations, which is actually very surprising because both of those have been around for about 40 years now, but it's only been relatively recently that we've kind of been exploring new regions of parameter space um, with hydrodynamical simulations and have discovered this kind of discrepancy. Um, and then what that kind of motivated us to do is to come up with a, a new model for understanding um, kind of the bulk properties of TDEs, things like the peak um, and the accretion rate and the accretion luminosity as a function of the type of the star that you destroy and the mass of the black hole. And so I'll talk about that and then discuss the implications um, of this new model in the context of various aspects of TDEs, including jetted tidal disruption events. Um, so these are TDEs that display harder X-ray emission and that are interpreted as um, having a, a relativistic outflow launched uh, during the onset of the accretion that takes place in the TDE. Um, I'll talk a little bit about these it's horrible oxymoron, long duration transients. Um, these are transients that kind of rise, peak, and decay on time, on time scales of multiple years, in some cases decades. Um, and then finally, something called the TDE luminosity function, which is something we're getting a better handle on uh, with the increase in the number of statistics we've had from these systems um, with transient surveys. Um, and then at the very end, if I have time, uh, I want to just very briefly touch upon a um, program that we've been doing at Syracuse for the last couple of years, um, actually involving high school students from the Syracuse City School District. Um, so four of these students that worked with me for the past couple of years are actually authors on this paper. Um, so they really partook in some of the research that led to some of these discoveries. Um, and so I just want to kind of highlight that. And then I'll end, uh, of course, by taking any questions. All right, so as I said, what I want to start off with is just sort of the fundamentals of, of tidal disruption events or TDEs and how these things work. So this is an image I'm sure all of you have seen before, this, this couple, of image, couple of images, right, Event Horizon Telescope. We now have direct evidence for the existence of supermassive black holes. So objects, masses, hundreds of thousands to billions of times the mass of the sun that reside in the nuclei of galaxies. Um, some of these supermassive black holes, kind of ironically and paradoxically, are among the brightest objects in the universe. Okay, and so the way that works, of course, is it's not actually the black hole itself that's producing the light, but the, the gas in the immediate vicinity of the black hole that's undergoing this process of, of accretion. So viscous dissipation, so some sort of um, interaction, uh, some sort of viscous process coupling that takes place in something called an accretion disk allows material to sink deeper into the gravitational potential well of this supermassive black hole. 
In the process, it liberates a fraction of that um, binding energy that it loses to light, and it creates um, these extremely luminous objects called active galactic nuclei. And so you've all also probably seen this cartoon dozens of times. So the idea is that AGN, active galactic nuclei, come in different flavors uh, spectroscopically. But the idea is that all of them are powered by the same underlying physical mechanism that is viscous accretion. It's just that the observer line of sight dictates what we see spectroscopically. OK. So AGN are extraordinarily bright and offer um, insight into the nuclei of distant galaxies. They provide um, kind of more direct, not quite as direct as you know, the direct images that the EHT has now taken, um, but certainly uh, more direct evidence for the existence of supermassive black holes. Um, but unfortunately, most, most galaxies are not in this actively accreting state. Right? So it's only, only a few percent, uh, maybe 10% or so, of, of galaxies that are actually actively accreting and, and that display this AGN-like emission. And so for most of the galaxies, we're often forced to rely on sort of empirical relationships to try to understand the properties of the supermassive black holes in their centers, things like the M sigma relationship. But occasionally, even in, in a quiescent galaxy, so uh, a galaxy with a supermassive black hole that is not actively accreting, every once in a while, it's about once every 10 to 100,000 years or so for a given galaxy, an unlucky star wanders too close to the super, supermassive black hole in the nucleus of the galaxy. And when that happens, the tidal field of the supermassive black hole um, is extraordinarily strong and actually overcomes the self-gravitational field of the star itself, rips it apart, and creates what's called a tidal disruption event. And what this does is it actually provides um, kind of some fuel to the supermassive black hole and ignites this brief period of quasar-like emission in what are otherwise quiescent galaxies. And so TDEs, in principle, offer us a means to more directly probe the nuclei of distant galaxies and supermassive black holes. All right, so how does, again, how does this process work? What's sort of the physics involved in tidally destroying a star? Okay, so the idea is I have a supermassive black hole, I have a star in the galaxy hosting the supermassive black hole, and when the star is at very large distances from the supermassive black hole, tides are very weak, um, as I'll discuss in a couple more slides, um, the tidal field falls off as the inverse cube between the, of the distance between the star and the black hole. So when the star is at very large distances, tidal effects are small and the star is effectively spherical. But as the star continues to approach the black hole, the same sort of tidal effects that the Earth experiences by virtue of the existence of the moon start to play a role, right? And so the star becomes tidally distorted and approximately stretched roughly in the direction of the supermassive black hole. And the thing about black holes is that they're so massive and so compact that this star can actually continue on its ingress and become increasingly closer to the black hole to the point where the tidal field, okay, this stretching force, actually overcomes the self-gravitational field of the star itself. And so stars are bound to themselves by gravity. And so if the tidal field actually exceeds the self-gravitational force of the star, the star is ripped apart and forms this long, thin tendril of gas called a tidally disrupted stellar debris stream. Okay, so this is a silly little cartoon. Um, you can simulate this process uh, with hydrodynamics, so hydrodynamical simulations. This is just an example. So you might not be able to see it, but there's a, a one little pixel down here that is actually a star that's going to approach this supermassive black hole. And then the inset up here just shows a zoom in. So what happens is that I throw my star at this black hole. It's approaching. It's still far enough away that not much is happening. But as it passes through pericenter, you see it gets significantly tidally distorted and actually transformed into this kind of dumbbell-looking shape. I think I actually did the simulation when I was a grad student. <laughs> Been too lazy to update it. But um, OK, and so, <clears throat> so, so far, not None of this process is actually directly observable. There's no more light that is produced from the system than what was given by the original star. But where things start to get more interesting observationally is if you continue, continue on and you watch what happens, this is the same movie, I'm just um, fast forwarding it in time, is that some of this material actually starts to return to the supermassive black hole. 
So a fraction of this tidally disrupted stellar debris stream that you formed is gravitationally bound to the black hole, is going to return to the point of disruption. And the numerical, the resolution here is not nearly high enough to actually confidently say what the morphology of this thing should be. So this giant elliptical um, configuration of gas is probably not realistic. There's not enough physics in here. We don't have high enough resolution. So people today are still fighting about exactly what happens next, but we're pretty sure that some combination of processes eventually leads to what's called circularization and the formation of a relatively circular disk around this supermassive black hole that is formed out of this tidally disrupted debris. Okay, and so that's how this, this brief period of quasar-like emission gets started. It's the, the supply of this mass um, to the supermassive black hole. Okay, so these are nice artist conceptions, um, movies of simulations, silly cartoons, okay? So what do these things really look like? So nowadays, um, as I mentioned earlier, right, we have these transient surveys. So the Zwicky transient facility is one of them. Um, these optical UV surveys that are actually detecting many more TDEs. So this is just one example. So I'm showing you the, um, the apparent magnitude and the various ZTF bands here. And so this is sort of a, a stereotypical TDE. These, these events rise, reach a peak, and then most of the time smoothly and monotonically decay. Um, this is actually a log linear plot, so this decay here is not a power law, it's actually more like an exponential, which is strange and no one understands why that is, but uh, I guess that's why we do the science. <laughs> um, so if you kind of stare at this plot, what you realize is that if your survey is, is fast enough to catch the peak of this event in one or more bands, you can immediately define what you might call a peak time scale. So this is the time between the first detected light in some band and the corresponding peak that it reaches in that same band. And you can kind of see that, that depending on which band you pick, you might get a slightly different answer here, but they all kind of show the same trend independent of wavelength. And so there's a kind of robust definition you can make here that you'd call the peak time scale. This is the amount of time taken for this event to rise and reach a peak um, in some magnitude of your choosing. And as I said, right, these surveys are starting to detect a large number of these things. And so this is from the same paper by Erica Hammerstein. This is just 30 or so odd TDEs that have so far been detected by the ZTF survey. And there are many more now that have, I'm sure have been detected, and they're probably going to publish some paper relatively soon, um, cataloging the new events. But if you, if you kind of stare at this thing for a little while, you realize that all of these events are kind of showing similar characteristic rise and peak timescales. Okay, so clearly there's variation from source to source. Um, but it's something like, you know, on the order of 30 to 60 days, most of these events rise and reach their peak. And so the question then that, that you have to ask as an astronomer is, well, where does that 30 to 60 day timescale actually come from? And in particular, how can I relate my understanding of, of the tidal disruption process um, to kind of predict this timescale? And if I can do that, if I can understand the physics involved in these TDEs, I can then kind of accomplish the holy grail of TDE physics, which is to use observations of TDEs to place constraints on the supermassive black hole that did the disrupting. All right, and so that's kind of, a, kind of our job. And so the next couple slides, I just want to kind of walk you through um, kind of the basics of how people have modeled TDEs for some time now and just understand how this whole thing works um, with a very small amount of physics and math. Okay, so again, right, we're trying to understand how TDEs work. So I take a star, some radius r star, mass m star, match those to the sun if you want. The center of that star is, has some distance little r away from the supermassive black hole. Okay, and we know, according to Newton, gravity follows the inverse square law, gm over r squared. Okay, but the fact is that a star, like any other object in the universe, has a finite size. And so in addition to just the gravitational field, acting at the center of mass of the star, you can think about the difference in the gravitational field as you move around the surface of the star. Right? And that's going to change by some small amount because of the radial dependence, the spatial dependence of gravity. Okay, so if you take the difference in the gravitational field at the leading edge of the star from the far edge of the star, you do the most useful thing you've ever learned called a Taylor series expansion. Okay, so the leading order terms cancel and what you're left with is this um, leftover piece that scales as the inverse cube of the distance between the center of the star and the supermassive black hole. Okay, and so this is what we call the tidal field. 
So the title field, one over r cubed, um, what it's really responsible for is, is distorting the star, right? It's, it's the difference in the gravitational field across the stellar diameter. What that's trying to do is kind of elongate, squish the star a little bit, and destroy its otherwise spherically symmetric nature. Okay, so in the absence of any kind of restoring force, any tiny small difference in the force experienced across the diameter of the star would result in its destruction. So something has to be withstanding the tidal stretching um, produced by the tidal field, okay, and that something is also gravity, right? As I mentioned, stars are bound to themselves. And so what you can think about is the self-gravitational force at the surface of the star, so gm star over r star squared. That's kind of like the, that's the force responsible for resisting the tidal stretching that it experiences uh, from the black hole. And so what you can do is take the ratio of these two things. So you can take the ratio of the tidal field to the self-gravitational field at the surface of the star. And what this dimensionless number now gives you is a sense of the importance of tides. Right? So if this number is much, much less than one, tides kind of act like a perturbation on the star. And the star is able to resist um, the, the tidal distortion that it's experiencing. So one um, good example of a system that actually satisfies this inequality, this limit where tides are perturbative, is the Earth-Moon system. Okay, so if the Earth existed all alone by itself, out in empty space, it would do so happily as a sphere. But we know, of course, that the Earth doesn't exist all alone, right? It has this pesky companion called the moon. Okay, so same physics applies here, right? The Earth experiences the tidal force from the moon, the result being that the Earth doesn't exist happily as a sphere, it exists happily as this kind of ellipsoidal thing, right? So if you look at the numbers here, this ratio is on the order of something like 10 to the minus 7, is the ratio of the tidal field to the self-gravitational field at the surface of the Earth. Okay, so apparently in this limit, tides are kind of this perturbing force um, that serves to slightly modify uh, the body, right? And in this case, we're able to live with this, right? It's not so bad. Okay, so this is this like perturbative limit. Um, this is very well understood and has been studied a lot, um, especially in the context of the formation of X-ray binaries, so tidal capture. Um, but what we're interested in, what we're more interested in, is what happens when this ratio starts to become close to one, right? So as the ratio of the, the tidal force to the self-gravitational force um, increases, right? So the idea here is that I have a star with some fixed mass, some fixed radius, I have a black hole with some fixed mass as well, but the distance between the two is going down, right? So little r is decreasing, and hence this ratio is starting to go up as the star nears the supermassive black hole. So when this ratio gets to be comparable to one, that implies that the star is not really readily capable of withstanding the tidal field anymore. And, what, and if you can reach a distance at which this, this is roughly one, the star will be strongly perturbed by tides and potentially destroyed. And so if you do this, if you just set this, set this ratio to one, solve for little r, what you find is the distance within which a star has to come from a supermassive black hole to be tidally destroyed. Okay, and the name for this is the tidal radius. So if you ever read a paper on TDEs, this is like one of the first things that always appears, okay, and it's due to like, I think, Hill's 1975. Okay, so what this is, again, this is the distance you have to come within to be destroyed by tides. Okay, so this is proportional to the size of the, of the star, the proportional to the radius of the star, and this proportionality factor is the cube root of the ratio of the mass of the black hole to the mass of the star. All right, so I don't know, this isn't immediately meaningful to me as to how far away from the black hole this is. So if you kind of take standard numbers that everyone seems to adopt, so you take a million solar mass black hole, you take a solar-like star, what you work out is that this distance, this tidal radius, is something like 25 Schwarzschild radii, okay? And this is specific to the case of a million solar mass black hole. And that already is kind of interesting because 25 is not a very big number. And that means that actually general relativistic effects are not unimportant in establishing the dynamics um, of, this, of these sorts of systems. And it means that TDEs are kind of a probe of strong gravity in some sense. Okay, but this is how close you've got to get. And so this is kind of one half of the problem, right? So what we've established is that this is the distance within which a star has got to come in order to be successfully tidally destroyed. 
But as I said, right, none of this, this whole process, nothing here actually generates enough emission to be observable. Right? So what we have to do next is actually figure out what the ensuing aftermath consists of. Right? And so one way to do this, and, and this is not a super simple thing to do analytically, because self-gravity um, and the tidal field of the black hole and even the pressure within the star, all these things kind of come in at equal or comparable levels of importance. And so doing this um, analytically straightforwardly is not super easy. Um, and so one way to, to understand the ensuing aftermath is to just use hydrodynamical simulations. Okay, and so this is just another example. I've already showed you one a couple slides ago. Um, you can take your star, throw it at a black hole with your favorite code, and watch what happens. Okay, so this is slightly different than the one that I showed you before. This is actually an example of what's called a partial tidal disruption event, and I'll say a little bit more of that later. But the problem is what you really want to do, you know, the universe produces many different types of star. There are also many different types of black hole in terms of their mass and spin. So really what you want to kind of, what you want to kind of get is an overall understanding of how this process works as a function of the properties of the star and the properties of the supermassive black hole. So you don't want to run just simulations until the end of time to try to understand that because these things actually can be quite expensive. Um, especially if you want to do it at you know, high resolution, something like 100 million particles, just one of these simulations takes a month of real time. So instead, what you really would prefer is some kind of an analytical approximation, right? Some relatively simple um, algorithm, essentially, where you can take any kind of star you want, the black hole mass, right? You plug it into this algorithm and out pops a number for something like T peak, for example, the peak in the accretion rate of a TDE. Okay, and there's this, what I'm showing you here, this is actually from a paper from when I was here. Uh, so one very well-known and often used analytical approximation for this is something called the frozen end approximation. And that's what um, this is showing you here on the right. So the idea, I made this image in Inkscape, which is a really terrible program, <laughs> never use it. So the idea is, I'm being recorded. Uh, the idea is that you, you say, well, I know when I'm at large distances from the black hole, the tidal field falls off as one over r cubed, right? It's very weak at large distances. So why don't I say, well, let's just assume my star is in perfect hydrostatic equilibrium with the center of mass until I reach this distance called the tidal radius. And it's at that distance and within that distance that tides rapidly become overwhelming in terms of determining the dynamics. And so what you essentially say is, well, I let my star come in, retain perfect hydrostatic equilibrium until it reaches the tidal radius at which point the star is destroyed, meaning that I turn off self-gravity, I turn off pressure, and I just let my kind of little fluid elements into which I break up my star just follow ballistic Keplerian orbits, or the general relativistic analog, in the gravitational field of this black hole. Okay, so that's what's happening here. So I'm taking this model, and then I'm just evolving. There's actually a discrete number of particles. If you stare here, you can see that these particles are one by one returning, right? And I just follow their ballistic motion. And what I can do then is actually calculate the accretion rate onto the supermassive black hole. Technically, it's, it's called a fallback rate, but I'm just going to wave my hands and say that those are the same thing. All right, so this model, this frozen in approximation, um, originally was proposed by uh, Lacey Townsend Hollenbach back in 1982. And then much more recently, Giuseppe Lodato, Andrew King, and Jim Pringle showed that you can actually generalize what was said in the Lacey Townsend Hollenbach paper to account for any type of star. So essentially you say, well, I'm going to take my favorite star cooked up with my favorite stellar evolution code, throw it at a black hole of my choosing, and I can calculate things like T peak and M dot peak effectively instantaneously compared to how long it takes to do the same thing with a hydro simulation. Okay, and the question is, does it actually work? Right? Because, I mean, it's great to have a simple little algorithm that will churn you out a number, uh, but if it doesn't agree with with simulations that don't make these same sorts of assumptions, it's not very useful. Okay, so does it work? All right, so what I'm showing you here on the left, this is a paper by Evans and Kochanik back in 1989. Okay, so we're talking 30 some years ago. What this is showing is actually what I just said, right? So this is a hydrodynamical simulation where um, they've taken their SAR, they've destroyed it, and they've measured the accretion rate onto the black hole that results from this TDE. Okay, and so you can see rises, peaks, and then it falls off as this power law in time, t to the minus 5 thirds, which is a kind of standard hallmark prediction of TDEs. 
OK, so you know, many years later, <laughs> me and, and Chris Nixon, while uh, we were here, actually redid this simulation. OK, and you can see the vertical axis is the same here. We're just looking at m dot. This is the rate at which mass is supplied to the supermassive black hole, which we think scales with the accretion luminosity and the luminosity of the observed event. And if you compare these two things, you compare this black curve to this black curve, they're like very, very similar, right? And what's funny is we increase the resolution here, we'll actually increase the particle number by about a factor of 1,000 compared to what Evans and Kochanik were able to do back in 1989, and we still get effectively the same answer. So what that shows you is that the hydro for this specific problem is what I would call converged, right? People agree on the answer for that. Um, I should say this is for a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole, specifically. So, but now what I've also included on this plot is the prediction from this frozen end model, right? This is where I'm saying my star comes in, reaches the tidal radius, everything follows ballistic trajectories thereafter, and this is the result that comes out of that. And if you just kind of eyeball this, right, this is, this is you know, not so bad, right, the difference between these various timescales. Um, and in particular, you know, you look at this T peak, the difference between these, these two values, it's something like a factor of two. So, as an analytic theorist, anytime I get something right to within a factor of two, I consider that a victory, right? <laughs> so, you know, that's not bad. And to be specific, though, this is a very, uh, a very specific type of star, okay? And, in, and if you need to know, it's what's called a five-thirds polytrope. It just means that in my original star, the pressure um, is related to the density via p goes like rho to the five-thirds. Okay, and so then this, this five-thirds polytropic distribution, the density profile is kind of stretched and matched um, to the bulk properties of the sun. So basically I say I want my star to be one solar mass, one solar radius, it has this five-thirds polytropic structure, and I throw it at a 10 to the six solar mass black hole, and it's this, this curve, the black curve, that comes out. Okay, so what I'm saying is it's not a bad approximation for this type of star, but the, the obvious question you should then ask is does it work for other types of star? And I don't know, the naive thing is like, well, why wouldn't it, right? It works for this type of star. Like, what's, there's nothing special about a 5 thirds polytrope, right? Okay, so it turns out that's not true. So this is a, a much more recent plot. Uh, the frame really did not show up on here, but um, this is the same, the same thing that I'm plotting here. Okay, so in this case, I've actually taken a one solar mass star that I've evolved with uh, the stellar evolution code called MESA, so Modules for Experiments in Stellar Astrophysics. Um, this type, this star is actually much denser than a 5 thirds polytrope. Um, central density of the sun is something like 100 grams per cubic centimeter. Um, that's much, much denser than you would predict from this 5 thirds polytrope approximation. And the numerical solution, right, so this is where I've taken my hydro code and I've destroyed my star. The numerical prediction here, or the numerical solution predicts that this thing rises and peaks on a time scale of something like 20 days. It's actually not far off from what the 5 thirds polytrope thing showed. But the frozen in model, okay, so that's the dot dash curve here, predicts something that's very different, right? This is saying that the peak in the accretion rate itself is down by, you know, an order of magnitude. And similarly, this peak time scale, as predicted by the frozen in model, is also longer by about a factor of 10, right? This is 200, this is compared to 20 days. So apparently, this frozen end approximation does not do a very good job at reproducing the accretion rate from this type of star. So you can redo this experiment, okay? So this is a three solar mass star. Again, I'm doing all the same stuff. In this case, this thing rises, reaches a peak again on something like 20 days, right? So very similar to what we saw for the one solar mass case. But now, right, the frozen end prediction for this is way out there. Okay, so this is peaking now. The prediction here is, is something like, you know, a little more than 1,000 days. So that means that this simple analytical model is discrepant by now two orders of magnitude for this type of star, which is bad. But it's even worse because you can imagine, right, let's imagine that this is my observation, okay, that comes from my hydro simulation, and here's my model. And so what I have to do now is tune and change some parameters in my model to be able to match this peak time scale, right? And one of those parameters you can change is the mass of the black hole. And it turns out that the relationship between this peak time scale and the black hole mass is actually a fairly weak scaling. It only goes as the black hole mass to the one half. So what that means is that if I want to bring 
this, you know, 1,500 days into agreement with this 20 days, I actually have to reduce the mass of my black hole by about four orders of magnitude in order to achieve that, which is not good, <laughs> right? Essentially what that's saying is that I'm incorrectly deducing the mass of my black hole by four orders of magnitude by using this model. That doesn't actually capture effectively what's happening here. Okay, so what is wrong, <laughs> right? What is going wrong specifically with these high mass stars um, that's producing this discrepancy? And again, I think what's really interesting about this is that people for a long time were doing exactly the 5 thirds polytrope matched to a sun disruption by a 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole. And that's why I think this problem wasn't really known about until very recently where we started looking at different types of star. Okay, so what's wrong? So something is wrong and something, we're missing something physical, right? Because an analytical model, um, you know, the simple model is, is kind of saying, this is our representation of what we think we understand about how TDEs work. And our experiments, the numerical experiments, are showing us that something is not right. Something is incomplete. Okay, so we need some kind of a new model. So back just a couple of years ago, um, my collaborator and I, so Chris Nixon, so Chris was actually a postdoc, he was an Einstein fellow here when I was a graduate student. What we said and what we proposed is that there's actually a problem with the definition of the tidal radius. Right, so the tidal radius is this distance within which you have to come in order to be completely destroyed. And if you recall, what we did to derive that was we equated the self-gravitational field at the stellar surface to the tidal field. But the thing is, and this is especially true as you get to more massive and more evolved stars, the thing is that the self-gravitational field of a spherical object does not peak at its surface. It actually peaks somewhere in the middle. And that's what this plot is actually showing you here. So I'm, I have three different stars that I evolved with MESA. The horizontal axis is distance from the center of that star, capital R, relative to the outer radius. So this goes from zero to one by construction. And then the vertical axis is the self-gravitational field. So that's GM enclosed as a function of R divided by R squared relative to the maximum value. So these things all rise, reach a peak somewhere in the interior of the star reach a peak that by definition is one, and then as we go to the surface, there's roughly a one over r squared dependence, and then it's exactly one over r squared outside of that. And so what this is showing you is that when I have a low mass star, low mass stars are actually well approximated by five-thirds polytropes, okay, the ratio of the maximum self-gravitational field to the surface gravitational field is not too far off from one. All right, it's about 1.8 for this 0 0.3 solar mass star here. But as I get to larger mass stars, and also those that are more highly evolved along the main sequence, this, this ratio actually becomes much larger than one and is over a factor of 10 in this specific case here. And so all we said was, if you wanna completely destroy a star, it makes sense to say that the tidal force has to overcome not the surface gravitational field, but the maximum self-gravitational field, right? And what that leads to is kind of a different distance within which the star has to come to be tidally destroyed. And I'm not going to say too much about it because I don't have time, but there's also, if you think about this for a long time, you, can, you, you realize that there's actually a prediction that you can come up with from this model for the peak time scale, this T peak, and also M dot peak, right? And it's just like the frozen in approximation in that it's, you can do this effectively instantaneously. You just take your favorite star, run it through your Mathematica code, and out pops a number. Um, but again, you kind of have to ask the same question, is does this revised model that gives us these various properties of TDEs, does it actually agree with hydro um, simulations? And so based on the fact that I'm standing up here telling you about it, you can probably guess the answer to that is yes. Okay, so to show you that, I have kind of a, this is kind of a, a busy plot, but it's actually just a collection of data points. So on the vertical axis, what I'm showing you here is m dot peak. Okay, so this is the peak and the accretion rate of a TDE. On the horizontal axis is t peak, right? This is the time taken to reach the peak in a TDE. And every single symbol on this plot is a different star, right? So the color corresponds to the mass. So this is the mass that I feed into MESA. I have it crank me out a uh, stellar profile, a density profile. And then the different symbols indicate the age of the star, okay? So circles here, for example, indicate a prediction for m dot peak and t peak for a given type of star at the zero age main sequence. So this is when the star first starts burning hydrogen in its core. 
Right? So if you pick a data point, let's pick this point out here. Okay? The color tells me that this is a five solar mass star that I evolved with MESA. The circle indicates that this is at the zero age main sequence. And this is the frozen in prediction for this specific type of star, for these two quantities, m dot peak and t peak. So what you can now do is go and find the same color right, that comes out of this new, what I'm going to call CN22 for Coglin in 2022, uh, from this new model. OK, so this is, again, the color indicates, oh, I don't know what I just did. Uh, OK, I don't know how I did that. But, uh, so the color indicates, again, this is the same five solar mass star. Okay, so these two stars are the same in terms of their age and their mass. But what you're seeing is that there's a vastly different prediction that's actually coming out of this. Okay, so this is this new model that we're proposing here. And what the frozen in model, the old model, is essentially telling you is that as, as I get to more massive stars, the time taken to reach, a peak, reach the peak in the fallback and the accretion rate of the TDE gets extended to later and later times. And so you could conceivably use this to say, well, massive star disruptions must give me really long duration transients, right? And also the peak in the accretion rate has gone down quite a lot compared to, say, a lower mass star up here. But essentially what you're seeing is that this new model makes a completely different prediction for this. And if you, if you go ahead and you zoom in, on this collection of points, what you see is that across this really broad range in stellar mass and zero age main sequence is when you first start burning hydrogen, terminal age main sequence is when the hydrogen mass fraction in the core is less than 0.1%, and then <laughs> MAMS just stands for middle age main sequence, it's somewhere in between. Okay, so across all these different stars, you know, like 70 some stars here, apparently what this model is predicting is that the peak in the accretion rate of a TDE is 25 plus or minus five days, independent of anything really to do with the type of star. And I should say this is specific for the case of a 10 to the six solar mass black hole. So if you want to do this for a different black hole mass, you simply take the mass in units of 10 to the six, take the square root, and you multiply the horizontal axis by that number. So for Sagittarius A star, four times 10 to the six, just multiply all these numbers by a factor of two. Okay, so that's a really, and right, didn't say the most important thing, okay. There are also other symbols here that come from hydro simulations. And you can just, again, the colors line up. This, was, this plot was made by Ananya. I really love this plot. Um, these things agree with one another. Okay. So this is really interesting. Okay. I think this is like kind of a, a new way forward for understanding some of these properties of TDEs um, you know, over a, a broad range of parameter space that you can now study. And so what are the implications of this? First one is for jetted tidal disruption events. So I've already mentioned what this is. These are, are TDEs that display harder emission that we've now interpreted as arising from a relativistic jet that is launched along our line of sight. So Swift J1644 plus 57. This was like all the rage when I started here as a grad student. Um, up here is just showing you the Swift um, XRT light curve of this thing with another Chandra point thrown in here. Um, this thing was X-ray active, um, extraordinarily bright for about 500 days, at which point it just abruptly shut off in terms of the X-ray emission. Um, since then, we've observed um, three more of these things. So J2058, J1112, and then just um, about a year and a half ago, this, this brand new one, AT2022 CMC. Um, these are all interpreted as arising from jetted TDEs. The kind of driving mechanism, so something that Mitch and I have been working on for a long time, right? Perhaps the driving mechanism here is related to what's called super Eddington accretion. So there's so much luminous emission coming from this accretion process that the radiation pressure is actually able to drive out the mass, right? Which doesn't make any sense because if that were true, you wouldn't have any gas to accrete in the first place. So the idea is in these systems, perhaps it's super Eddington accretion and all of that energy, or at least the vast majority of it, is getting exhausted out from the system via these relativistic jets. Okay, so if you look at this now, and you say, well, the most highly super Eddington TDEs that we can produce according to this new model are actually the disruption of high mass stars. So maybe for these jetted TDEs, what you actually need are highly super Eddington accretion rates, which then apparently requires the disruption of very high mass stars. And high mass stars are intrinsically rare and they're also short lived. So what that means is that perhaps this explains sort of the rarity of jetted TDEs. We've seen four of them out of you know, a couple hundred now that we've so far observed. And it would also say that 
the host galaxies of these jetted TDEs should be young and star forming because massive stars don't live for very long. And that correlation has been observed for 1644 and tentatively observed for AT2022 CMC, which is really interesting. Okay, so the second, these long duration transients. Okay, so some extragalactic outbursts, like this one that I'm showing you up here, rise, peak, and decay over a thousand day timescales, right? So this is multiple years. Um, this specific uh, galactic outburst here is from GSN 069, um, showed this really big flare that again decayed over something like a decade. And at this point down here, uh, it actually did something really, really interesting called and generated what we now call QPEs, okay? That's really fascinating, um, fun to think about, but it's not this talk, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so what our results essentially show is that you, can't, you cannot create this long duration transient by the disruption of any star, right? So previously with the frozen in approximation, you'd say, well, high mass stars generate these really long T peaks, right? So maybe this was the disruption of a high mass star. But apparently, right, this new model says that that actually doesn't work. Um, but, right, the thing I haven't really mentioned so far is that you don't have to completely disrupt the star, you can actually partially destroy it. And so that's actually what this movie, this is the same one that I showed you a few slides ago, is what this is showing, um, is that in some cases you can actually have a core that survives this encounter. Um, and what this does is it really fundamentally changes this accretion rate and instead of falling off as t to the minus 5 thirds, it actually falls off significantly steeper as more like t to the minus 2.25. Okay, and that's what this curve here shows from Minuti et al. And this is from their paper. I didn't just draw this on there. <laughs> okay, so these long duration transients, you basically can't explain as the complete disruption of anything, but partial TDs can do it. And if it displays this t to the minus 9 fourths ish thing, that's consistent. Okay, and then finally, right, TD statistics. So this is the same plot that I showed from the Hammerstein paper. Um, coming up, you know, imminently, we have Rubin uh, and the Legacy Survey Space and Time. Hopefully, that's going to detect many more of these things. And what these results then show is that complete TDEs, the rise time, the peak time scale, is very insensitive to the type of star, right? But there is this black hole mass dependence, black hole mass of the one half. So maybe, maybe if you can measure the peak time scale for a lot of these systems. Really what you could actually be directly probing and looking into is the mass of the black hole. And so perhaps you can actually use this to start to, again, kind of achieve the thing that we've all been setting out to do, which is to try to use TDEs to understand the properties of supermassive black holes. How am I in time? Do I have like five minutes? <laughs> okay. All right. So the very last thing that I want to do um, is I actually just want to describe um, this program that we have at Syracuse University called Syracuse University Research and Physics. So um, I've been talking about you know, the results that are in this paper. Um, the author list is pretty eclectic in terms of the career stages of the various authors. So Ananya Bendopadhyay, um, Dan Paradiso, and Matthew Todd um, are all graduate students at, at SU in the physics department. Um, Julia Fancher is an undergraduate student who's actually a sophomore um, working with me. And then Aluel Athian, uh, Valentino and Delicato, Sarah Capalanga, and Angela Kuma are actually all high school students. And these students participated in this Syracuse University Research and Physics program. Um, so this actually brings in um, on the order of 10 to 15 high school students from the Syracuse City School District into the physics department to do research with us for six weeks over the summer. Um, and it's actually a paid position. We also provide them transportation um, and actually meals the whole time that they're there. Um, and this is the very final day of the um, of the program in 2022 and in 2023, where we actually have a poster uh, session where they all get to display their results. Um, and so these are the four students that worked with me over the past couple of years. You can see some nice plots of accretion rates in the background here. Um, <laughs> um, so these, these students really did um, real research um, with us, and I think that's just a really cool thing. So this is Jenny Ross. Um, she's the, our department chair um, who really has been like spearheading a lot of this. Um, so with that, I'm going to finish up. And the last thing I'll say is that if you really love TDEs and related phenomena, uh, we have a, a conference coming up at the KITP um, this coming April. So if you're super interested, I encourage you to go sign up, and uh, I'll take any questions. What? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> 
OK, Wait. fine. Go ahead, Tetsuya. Yeah. Um, so with the uh, maximum self-gravity happening somewhere in the middle, yep. would your new model then predict a higher proportion of partial PDs? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So you need to, so especially for these high mass stars, you need to come within. So actually, there's a plot in, the, in this paper that I didn't show here that actually has essentially the, the effective tidal radius of the star that accounts for this effect. And in the most extreme cases, when you have very highly evolved stars along the main sequence, the true tidal radius can be close to a factor of 10 smaller than what you would predict from uh, just the equating the surface gravity. Yeah, so that means that you need, th those are gonna be considerably rarer events. If you just think about kind of the probability of just throwing darts at the dartboard, you have a much smaller region to get them into. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that'd be, and especially with you know some of the stuff you're doing on eccentric nuclear disks, I think that's definitely possible. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with the so because it's a school moon, I idea that the rise time should scale towards the flexible mass or whatever, and come up with the school moon and then the flexible mass. Are do we expect like how close to the moon would we have? That's a very good question. Um, like oftentimes, people sort of use and actually extrapolate things like the M sigma relationship. Um, you know, it's much rarer that you have some like maser emission to give you a much more direct probe of the mass of the black hole. As far as I know, there has not yet been a coincident TDE with like a, a very well confirmed supermassive black hole mass. Um, I actually don't know the answer to your question. I don't know how how long we're going to have to wait <laughs> in order for that to happen. But yeah, good question. So obviously, we couldn't do this um, for just one galaxy, but you know, this doesn't happen often enough. Yep. But how viable do you think it is to use um, partial versus complete uh, TDE, uh, TDEs that could essentially to constrain um, stellar populations? Yeah, so this is something that I didn't, really, I didn't really touch on, right? So this model that we came up with is really appropriate for complete disruptions. Um, and so what needs to now be done is to kind of extend this to account for the case of partial TDs. Because as I was just saying to Tetsuya, the, partial, the possibility of partials in general, um, the probability of that is higher than a complete TDE. Um, nonetheless, of course, the, the accretion rate for a partial is lower. And so perhaps we're somewhat biased towards seeing um, complete disruptions and the more energetic uh, events. And so really what you need is a way to, really what you need is a prediction for what the corresponding peak value is in the case of a partial as well. And that's really what I want to do and it's actually something I think I know how to do. Um, and then you can really start to assess degeneracies in these various parameters, right? And so like I could produce a lower peak accretion rate by having a smaller star or I could just partially disrupt it. But then the hope is if you can actually monitor um, the accretion luminosity with time, perhaps you can disambiguate those scenarios by looking at the steeper fall off rate. Yeah. So, yeah, so like basically why is it peaking from the 20 days? Like where is that coming out from the model? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I didn't, <laughs> I didn't expect this, right? I thought that there was still going to be some dependence on the properties of the star. Um, but I, essentially what it comes down to is that if you remember from that plot that I was showing, um, there's this, right, so this plot, right? So there's kind of a special radius in the star at which the self-gravitational field peaks. And what you can kind of do is say, well, all this material in here, you can kind of apply the same reasoning of the Fresnan approximation to say that all of that material is roughly unperturbed as it comes in. 
And so you're kind of like stripping off successive layers of the star until you reach this point at which, at which moment you're completely destroyed, is the idea. And so it turns out you can analytically show that at this radius, there's roughly the same amount of mass interior to this radius and exterior to, it just turns out that way. Um, and what I kind of reasoned was that therefore, the sort of like fallback time or the return time um, from this radius within the star should correlate tightly with the, the peak and the accretion rate. Um, and that is essentially what goes into this model, is saying that the peak accretion rate time should be roughly the orbital time from this distance, modulo what turns out to be exactly a factor of two, seemingly, and I can't explain where that factor of two comes from. Um, so I don't actually have a very good answer for you. <laughs> um, somehow it just seems to come out of this. Um, and actually, I mean, what's, what's really sort of interesting is that you can, you can approximate where in the star this, this distance occurs, and you can kind of make an analytical prediction for what this should be if you only account for one additional parameter in this model, which is actually the central density, um, and actually the ratio of the central density to the average density. And it turns out that the result that comes from that, the prediction and the scaling of T-peak with the various properties of the star, actually don't give you, um, they don't actually give you this. <laughs> um, it's actually, there's, that actually predicts that there's still a much stronger dependence um, on the, the stellar type than what actually comes out of this model. Um, and so what I think that means is that it's not just the central density, but it's actually something, it's more, there's more <laughs> ingredients that actually go into this that determine this, um, this outcome. But I don't have a very good answer for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Essentially, and apparently, yes. <laughs> it's the time. It's the time taken for. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like if you take the frozen approximation and you apply it to that radius in the star with the self gravitational field peaks, you can calculate that time scale. And my argument is that that should be very tightly coupled to the the t peak value that you get out. And it turns out it is two within a factor of two. <laughs> Uh, it's a factor of two too long, so you need to multiply by one half. So the 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 prediction is longer than observed by a factor of two. So this is if you take into account this factor of two, then this is what it gives you, and you get very nice agreement with all the hydro simulations. So, yeah, I mean, so my, I don't know, I'm coming to the conclusion that perhaps in these optical UV TDEs, because there's a variety in terms of their spectroscopic um, behavior and also evolution, what I'm starting to think is that actually in these systems, what we're really seeing is an early phase of like super Eddington accretion. And so what's happening is that, but we're looking at it not where you would drive a wind if you have some centrifugally supported disk. We're just looking at it kind of off axis. And so like in these super Eddington phases, the material is like really hot, right? Puffy and actually much more like, like a star, right? I mean, this like zebra thing that uh, Mitch and I came up with when I was a grad student here. So what I, and if you look at observationally what like the photospheric radii of these things tend to do, they kind of just sit at around 10 to the 15 centimeters or so. So like my feeling is maybe what's happening is that you're kind of inflating and puffing up this like basically star that surrounds the supermassive black hole. And the accretion rate is so high that that thing is effectively energetically kind of in equilibrium. And so even though we're not even though we're not probing the like, you know, 10 to the 6 Kelvin gas that's ultimately accreting onto the black hole and producing the emission, what we're kind of seeing is this reprocessed, um, significantly lower temperature, 10 to the 4-ish Kelvin gas. Nonetheless, 
I think what it's kind of saying is that if this thing is energetically in equilibrium, then the amount of energy emitted is actually very tightly coupled to the accretion process on the black hole. And so that's kind of what I'm thinking, um, is that perhaps in these optical UV TDEs, what we're really directly measuring is the accretion rate on the black hole by looking at the light curve, yeah. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Not, I, I have been thinking about that more in the context of this very recent result where there's actually like X-ray reflection from clouds near the galactic center that suggest that there was a past accretion event like only hundreds or so years ago. And maybe <laughs> if you extrapolate back and you say, well, T peak happened whenever and it's got a T to the minus five thirds decay since then, does that resulting accretion rate actually correlate and agree with what you see for the accretion rate on the Sagittarius A star? But the pressure, these remnants are yeah. very different. We have spectroscopic surveys ongoing. Like okay. Like this one, they're going to see this black hole. Yeah. So with the, if there's a large population of anomalous stars. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there have been um, kind of a handful of simulations, uh, especially going back to like, so Stefan Roswag um, back in 2019 um, and Emilio Tejeda and um, Gafton, I think, was the, the first author on this. I, I think like essentially what happens is that if you include or account for relativistic effects, the tidal field is essentially stronger. And so you end up tidally destroying the star at a larger distance. But I think like a lot of the a lot of these arguments are kind of agnostic to that in a sense, and so my guess is that actually there's not much of a dependence on the mass of the black hole that is introduced by virtue of the fact that you're now accounting for relativity. That's kind of my that's my guess, and that's sort of what some past simulations have shown. Great. Well, let's thank Eric. Once again. Thanks. And, uh, I don't know how to turn this thing off. Uh, this little switch. Uh,